Welcome to this edition of People's Daily Talk. And joining me today for the discussion is Dr. Jacob Frankel. He is the chairman with JP Morgan Chase International. The IMF has cut the global growth forecast to 3.7% in October. That's 0.2 percentage points lower than its previous forecast. So what do you think are the major risks that could hamper global growth? Well, to begin with, we need to put things in perspective. Um, remember, we are now in the 10th anniversary of the great financial crisis. And for quite a few years since the crisis erupted a decade ago, we have had uh, some countries and some regions either not growing at all or growing very slowly. So we are now in a, a year in which all regions of the world are growing positively at a growth rate which is much higher than what it has been during any year during the past decade, number one. Number two, there are indeed some clouds on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And the main cloud, I believe, is from a potential uh, danger that comes from trade interventions. Some call it trade skirmishes, some call it trade war. Whatever way you call it, this can create a psychological uncertainty that may prevent investors to invest because they don't know how the future will look like. They don't know if they can sell their products internationally. They don't know if they need to change industries in which they are investing. So that uncertainty is not healthy for world growth. So I believe that uh, if we look at the contribution that trade has made during the past decades to the alleviation of poverty of, or to the growth of the standard of living, especially of the poor, we need to be very careful not to risk the slippery slope of trade war. So let's talk about China a little bit. For the first three quarters of this year, China's GDP increased by 6.7%, with 6.5% registered for the third quarter. How do you interpret this number? Well, to begin with, remember, China is one of the greatest miracles in world economics during the past 20 years. The role of China has increased dramatically. No time in history a country has increased its prominence in the global scene during such a short period of time as we have witnessed during the past two decades by China. Against this background, of course, when you grow very rapidly, too rapidly occasionally, there are some frictions. So what China has been doing during the past couple of years, if not more, they have been engaged in a dramatic change in the structure of the economy. Huge program of urbanization and great transformation from being relying on exports to rely on domestic demand. It is, in this regard, the move from manufacturing to services. Those are dramatic changes in the structure of production and the economy, which explains part of the uh, slower growth. I wouldn't call it, I will not call it slowdown, because it's a very rapid growth. So I think that I remember still that a few years ago, people were worried about hard landing, soft learning, a lending, the Chinese authorities have demonstrated their ability to navigate the economy in a very skillful way and I am confident that growth will continue and if it is slower by few percentage points or by few uh, fractions of a percent, I am not overly impressed by it because what is important is the quality of growth and the inclusiveness of growth rather than just the number of GDP growth. Yeah, exactly. You once said in an interview that uh, China is a giant. Any uncertainty in this country will be exported to other nations. I mean, how important is China's growth to, other, to the world economy? China is an extremely well-integrated 
into the world economic system. It is either the most important or the second most important destination of exports for most of the countries in the world. It is extremely integrated into the supply chain of most countries in the world. And it is like a complex wall that if you remove one brick, the entire wall is crumbling. So yes, China is extremely important and uh, therefore I think that the main challenge is to ensure that the, it's a China is part of the world governance system. So it's not just another country that observes the world. It's, another, it's a country that is part of the world, navigates the world, takes responsibility for the world, and is represented in the various institutions in a way that is commensurate with its importance. Okay, so let's move to the United States a little bit. So at the moment, the U.S. economy is, uh, looks very strong. Um, however, some other worry that uh, with Trump imposing tariffs on many imports and with Federal Reserve is uh, hiking the interest rate, many worry this might weaken the economy in the coming month ahead. Like, what's your take on that? Well, I believe that from the industrial world, the U.S. is the best performer. So I think that there has been very important boost to the U.S. economy from the economic policies. By the same token, the area of the trade, those are the clouds. And if indeed those uh, tensions are viewed as just a negotiating strategy and uh, hopefully will bring together President Xi and President Trump and uh, the rest of the people to bring about normalization, then it will be better for everyone. So I very much hope that uh, in the trade area, the justified and justifiable concerns will be addressed without destroying the links between the economies. Because two giants cannot afford being in tension. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Now, as far as the Federal Reserve is concerned, in my book, uh, the normalization of interest rates, namely the very gradual increase of interest rates by the US, that's an encouraging sign. Because this means that the Federal Reserve assesses that the US economy is sufficiently robust, that it can sustain it, because it's very unhealthy Right. to live on steroids. Mm -hmm. So the low interest rates were necessary during the crisis. We have been there 10 years ago and it's time to exit. Mm -hmm. So do you believe that the Federal Reserve maybe will normalize interest rate in 2019? Yes. Okay. So, but at the moment, I think uh, uh, the European Central Bank and Jap uh, the Bank of Japan are still implementing quantitative easing while the U.S. started pulling out of quantitative easing. Uh, all those major economies, I mean, the central bank seems not very coordinated in monetary policy. Does this mean that the recovery is still, like, it's very fragile globally? Well, the fact that two cars are on the road and at different pace does not mean that they are not going into the same destination. The U.S. and Japan and the United Kingdom and Europe have entered all into the great financial crisis at the same time. But they have traveled along the roads at different pace and that's why the US is now ready to exit. Europe and Japan not yet, but they are not operating in opposite directions. The cars are just driving in a different pace. So it may look uncoordinated, but they are just driving in different pace. But it also means that we will have a period now in which, if you don't look at the details, it seems like the US is exiting from the unconventional policies, whereas other parts is not yet exiting. It does not mean lack of coordination or lack of harmonization. It means different paces of uh, exiting uh, from the road.